Good morning. <clears throat> this is an experience that uh, every family therapist should have. <laughs> have an opportunity to um, do a workshop that immediately follows Mario Cuomo in one day. <laughs> Be a part of the second plenary which follows Mario Cuomo. Then have the dubious honor to follow Frank Pittman and Betty Carter. <laughs> This experience uh, has just this networker conference will, will go down as a um, monumental one for me because uh, it's been like an intensive therapy experience, uh, therapy that I didn't request. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> been battling overriding and overwhelming levels of anxiety the, for the last 72 hours. And uh, it's, it's been a mixed bag, I'll have to be honest with you. Um, I was enjoying and feeling deeply inspired by Governor Cuomo's remarks yesterday, and I had this flash that you're on tomorrow. <laughs> then there were gaps in my attention span that rivaled the gaps in the Nixon tapes. And then I struggled incessantly and obsessively, which is, which is my way. It's, it's, I speak a lot about culture, but there are some things that are characterological. And uh, my, <laughs> my proclivity toward obsessions fall under the characterological category. <laughs> and then working with Rich Simon <laughs> triggers every characterological flaw that one ever has. So it's been it's been an interesting emo emotional roller coaster, and um, but it hasn't all been overcome and overridden with anxiety. I was just sitting here a few minutes ago thinking that um, this will make some of you nervous, but um, just bear with me. That it's something about the lowering of the lights here, and then us sitting here looking at lights, and make all of you look African American. <laughs> I began to relax, <laughs> feel the rhythm, soul shrivering. <laughs> and then I, um, I'm coming to you this morning, uh, another thought I had was, was sitting here feeling uh, this tremendous connection and feeling like I'm, I'm the embodiment, a uh, hybrid of uh, of Rosa Parks and Jackie Robinson, and feeling deeply honored and flattered to have the privilege to be here, and simultaneously recognizing that, um, that sometimes the pathway to these forums is a long road for some of us. And so I'm deeply honored and grateful to Rich and Laura for affording me the opportunity. And what I wanted to talk with you about this morning, I, I thought a great deal about this talk. I trust me that my obsessive way would not permit me to have it any other way. <laughs> and I have students in the audience that are probably finally glad this day has come because they're tired of passing my office and having to uh, have their demanding needs supplanted by, what am I going to do with the networker? <laughs> and so I thought at one point that I would um, uh, worried about the t what, what felt to me like enormous time constraints to talk about uh, philosophy of therapy. Holding that truth in one hand and then this resounding words of a trusted colleague of mine who takes every opportunity to remind me that, Ken, I think you suffer from an abstract thinking disorder. <laughs> so it's something about the confluence of those two experiences that just made me nervous as hell. So then I thought that what I would do is to put together some rather um, clever and creative and flippant remarks that were laced with lots of levity. And I had that all prepared to come in and share that with all of you. And then we would keep this light and we would laugh together. But then I kept hearing these voices. And I know that's dangerous to admit in a crowd. So <laughs> I was hearing these voices 
that I often hear saying, but don't forget. Don't forget us who have lost our voices. Do you represent us? And don't forget, Ken, don't forget, so many of us who are faceless don't joke. The world we live in is serious. Seize the moment. So I couldn't seem to extricate myself from those very troubling and intrusive voices. But I've learned over the years that um, perhaps my grandmother, who always had some profound wisdom that she attributed to this amorphous something, that something told me to do this, or something told me not to do it. So I've learned to trust that. And so what I want to talk with you about this morning and the uh, uh, amount of time I have is what I consider to be the essential elements of therapy as I think about it these days, as I think about it and as I attempt to practice it. And I don't think it's relegated simply to the confines of those pristine walls that um, make up our offices. I think it's, I consider these issues to be critical in my negotiation of my private life, my civilian life as well. And I think at, and I agree with the comment that Betty made, that what I do in some ways is, is not unlike what all of us here do. And I deal with the types of people and the types of problems that we all deal with here. But I've also begun to appreciate the ways in which at the core of whatever difficulty it is that those who come to me bring with them, at the core of it is this relationship between home, hope, and homelessness. And as a therapist, I have to continue to struggle and wrestle with the dialecticism of those three entities, home, hope, and hopelessness. And that Betty made the remark, and I think Frank alluded to it as well, that, um, that we live in a time, and I thought that Governor Cuomo mentioned this yesterday in very eloquent fashion, where there are tremendous opportunities for disconnection and fragmentation. And what these opportunities present to us is it placed right in front of our very eyes, right in front of my very eyes, the saliency and the significance of home. And though it seems like an incredibly benign and simple concept, for many of us, it's so incredibly difficult to create, to establish, and find a sense of home. And what's, impo and it, what's important is that when we can't find home, we can't be hopeful. We can't be hopeful. When Governor Cuomo raised the question, posed the question to us yesterday, somewhat rhetorically and repetitively, what are we? What do we stand for? What do we believe in? Those are questions that at first glance are so seemingly benign and simplistic. But we can't even begin to grasp the essence of those questions because the answers to those questions reside in our ability to find home. And for some of us, perhaps many of us, finding home is incredibly, incredibly difficult. Now when I speak of home, I'm really not talking just about home as a physical phenomenon. I'm talking about home in a metaphysical sense. A resting place, not simply for our aching and tired and overworked bodies, but for our scarred souls as well. So when I talk about home, I'm talking about a place where we attain and achieve some sense of inner peace. A place where love is unconditional. A place where I can be most, most certain that I am who I am and I'm accepted, appreciated, and affirmed for who I am. That's home. But for some of us, and perhaps many of us, home is so incredibly difficult to find. Then when I think about home, I think about this place where we find this meaningful connection between our sense of purpose and where we derive some sense of direction. 
But that's home. Home is where we begin to recognize the connection between our past, our present, and our future. Home is where we feel safe. We feel comfortable. We feel at peace with ourselves. And finally, home is that place where we derive our sense of rootedness to our existence. It's a place where the dichotomy, this artificial distinction between self and other is merely appreciated and respected for what it is. Words, semantics. Because home, when we find home, it has a way of bridging those gaps. And finally, home is a temple of our familiar. But some of us can't find home because our lives are paralyzed and maligned by chronic state of homelessness. It's just part and parcel of the world that we live in today. And homelessness involves something far more salient than not having a place to sleep or not having a roof or water, heat, air conditioning. Homelessness in its most disruptive form is disconnection. It's disconnection. The homelessness leaves us with this perpetual yearning for, as best we can put it, for that something else. We can't quantify it. We can't label it. We can't codify it. It's that something else that we have this incessant and insatiable yearning for. And the other thing I've come to learn and appreciate is that homelessness is not relegated to simply the people that, that I bypass on the street so many days of my life, that I see but I'm unable to see. Those people who remain visibly invisible to me But homelessness also, in pla also plagues many of the people that I see in therapy. And I would imagine many of the people that we all see in therapy. And if we had time and the courage, to be honest, to turn the lights back up, close the doors, and speak to, re speak to each other heart to heart, we could be at a place where we could recognize that even as we sit here, that there's so many of us in this room who are struggling and grappling with some sense of homelessness in our own lives. That I've been somewhat amazed to find that, that deeply embedded in each of us is a little piece of Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. We're all trying to make it home. We all have that piece of yearning that we can't quite put our fingers on, but it's so vitally important for us to have. Now, homelessness takes on many different forms and many different manifestations. I'd like to show you a clip now that I think would highlight just a few of the ways in which homelessness has beset and impacted our lives. Clip, please. If you in your hood and some punk ass hoe come rolling through your hood and try to blast on you or something, you gotta take care of your hood. You know what I'm saying? Because that's where you live. These days, don't nobody give a fuck about you. Don't nobody give a fuck about you. Don't nobody give a fuck about nobody. Unless, you know, unless like my G's give a fuck about me. You know, that's pretty much the only people I got. My whole family disowned me and I really don't give a fuck. I don't have very much love in my family at all. My mom walked out on me when I was a year old, um, me and my sister and my dad, and then when I was two, I got taken away from my dad. So, I mean, there, there wasn't really much, I mean, I haven't really had a family to lo have love in. Well, I was just, um, but me and my sister both were just to be, we're getting abused with my grandpa and my cousin. And then when we came up here, it happened by my dad. What we got We got abused. What did he do? Uh, he sexually abused us. Indian children, some as young as four years old, were taken from their parents, often by force, and sent to boarding schools.
At the boarding schools, children were stripped of all outward appearances, linking them to their Indian past. Our belongings were taken from us. Even the little medicine bags our mothers had given us to protect us from harm. Everything was placed in a heap and set afire. Next was the long hair, the pride of all the Indians. The boys, one by one, would break down and cry when they saw the braids thrown on the floor. Lone Wolf, Blackfeet. Children were forbidden to speak of their traditions and severely punished if they used their native languages. Fed distorted images of evil Indians, many came to doubt their own identity. I remember growing up that I never really felt good about myself. We were taught to be ashamed of who we were and who we are. And it hurts when you're, you're young and you're trying to understand. No, no! Don't tell me Negro! Nothing. What were you before the white man named you a Negro? And where were you? And what did you have? What was yours? What language did you speak then? What was your name? It couldn't have been Smith or Jones or Bunch or Powell. That wasn't your name. They don't have those kind of names where you and I came from. No, what was your name? And why don't you now know what your name was then? So you see, we, we see the number of ways, the multitudinous ways in which uh, there are any number of forces which assault our sense of home. Be it sexual abuse, child neglect, abandonment, poverty, racism, sexism, imperialism, heterosexism, homophobia, and the list goes on. That as long as these conditions exist, then it makes it difficult for so many of us to find home. And so what does all this mean for, for therapy? What it means for me is that I can all afford now my work to simply focus on the presenting problem, that which is handed in front of me. Because I know there's such an integral part of my work that involves something that's far greater than that. That therapy, as I think about it, has to involve healing on the one hand, attending to these wounds, and transformation on the other. How do we use ourselves? How do we use myself as a catalyst for change? Because I can't do all that needs to be done by sitting in my office and talking. Can't do it. So we have to be, I have to be, a catalyst for connection. That I think that I have to, and we have to be, hopefully, the manufacturers of hope. That we have to continue instilling hope even when hope ceased to exist. We have to continue, we have to continue dreaming long after those for whom we serve 
I've been unable to sleep. That's how I think about therapy these days. And as Frank mentioned, that we are who we are. We, we bring ourselves to the process. And so that there are some questions that I'd like to close with. You know, as the manufacturers of hope, as a community of concerned and empathic individuals who are concerned about home, hope, and homelessness, are we prepared to embrace our own sense of homelessness? Are we prepared to embrace, to embrace that? Can we appreciate the connections that we have in our lives? Can we risk challenging acts of injustice even when they don't affect us personally? Can we take a moral position, for example, on HIV and AIDS, separate and apart from our political views about who has it, why, or how they got it? Can we, at the micro level, pledge to continually challenge ourselves to appreciate the ways in which self and other, enemy and ally, oppressed and oppressor, we're all connected. We're all connected. And can we appreciate can we challenge ourselves to appreciate how all matters on the planet are related? And finally, do we really need all that we have? Thank you. <laughs>